still wrote this introduction, but it's exactly what I would have said if I were to do this, if I were to do it. And then we'll take a break and talk about it. Okay, David Kirshenbaum's work has appeared in the Brooklyn Book Review online. And we have our baldlapback.com, chain, pavement saw, and unpleasantevent-schedule.com, among others. He is the editor and publisher of Booth City, a New York City-based small press and community newspaper now in its 16th year. David also curates a couple of different reading series, one being D.A. Levy Lives, celebrating the Renegade Press, which is a monthly series held at ACA Galleries in Chelsea that focuses on the work of independent publishers. And another series is Booth City's Classic Albums Live, which brings together groups of musicians to do exactly what the title of the series says it does. David's editorial and curating work is extensive. He edited the one-shot anthology of the Booth Reader, an underrated gem of a book, cataloging the work of dozens of poets, and has done such things as collaborative postcard projects, putting poets onto baseball cards, organizing readings in community gardens, more to come this summer, and getting baseball players and poets to give joint readings at Charles, former Met, and Eleanor Nowen, circa 1977, for instance. His own writing draws no line between life and art. The line is there on its own, naturally, but the poems are made of pure, literal consciousness with a sprinkling of dream material. They can be intensely raw, observation by observation, focused on life, love, loneliness, what it takes to get through a day. Nostalgia is channeled through identification with distant characters, fictional and non-fictional, friendship and its ups and downs, and the basic fact of human interaction as both deep necessity for survival and necessary evil within the terms of socialization's game. Minor and major details do not get obscured. He is prolific and at our service. Please welcome David Kirshner. for the uh, kind words and the gig. Um, when I was finishing up my master's in Albany, and uh, I was going to move back downstate, and I'd never come here, and I'd known of the poetry project, um, I asked my friend Katie Yates, who used to uh, you know, assist down while I out in Europa and been here a bunch, and said, hey Katie, how do I become friends with all these people when I come downstate? And she said, just put away the chairs. And uh, so I went to my first reading in May of 93 to see my friend Chris Funkhauser read. And that's what I did. I put away the chairs. And uh, anyway, thank you for the, uh, coming down tonight. And uh, thanks, Buck, for the honor of reading with him. Um, let's see, so this poem. Um, Elizabeth Willis read a while back, and I'd never met her, but I knew of her. And she, um, yeah, so after the reading, I came up to her. And I said, you know, a couple of things that I talk about the reading, because I always hate it when, after reading, people are like, great reading, great reading. And it's like, well, why was it a great reading? So, <laughs> so, um, you know, so I told her, you know, things I liked. And, and then, without knowing her, I told her something I didn't like. She mentioned the horse uh, Seabiscuit, which was everywhere at the time. And I said, you could, you know, it's too easy to mention Seabiscuit. Mention, mention another horse. Mention, like, Ruffian. You know, and then like the next day, we're you know, like we're out that night and hanging out, and the next morning I'm feeling guilty that I'd never met this woman here. You know, so I sent her an email, and um, the the email is Paul, um, and uh, and with thanks to uh, Sean Cole and Carol Mirakov and uh, my buddy Ian, who's edited everything I've written since I was like 19. So um, so anyway, here you go. It's um, fun for Elizabeth when a bar mentioned a horse. I tore a hole in my thumb before my first trip out west, July 1975, eight and a half year old me, flatbush apartment, broken window, just the shard sticking out into the frame left. No super cleanup for what seemed like weeks, probably was hours. I took my right hand, balled it up into a fist, keeping my thumb on the outside as any good boxer knows. Otherwise, first punch, you break your own thumb and started pushing the broken glass out with my flexed right thumb. When you touch the scar, I still sense it. Ruffian against foolish pleasure, 
July 6, 1975, a match race pairing the best female horse of the day, Ruffian, against the best male horse of the day. Belmont Park and Carrie Uncle Sally's Fremont, California TV turned to CBS. My aunt and uncle have a black schnauzer candy. My older brother Stephen plays a little rough with her and pulls out one of her teeth from the gum. Blood everywhere as the race begins. My cousin Cindy and her friend Sherry have cut head and, sh have cut head and armholes into old pillowcases and they're wearing them around the house pretending to be older. Sherry's only wearing a pair of shorts beneath her pillowcase top, but Cindy has on a dress. Her ensemble always complete, even at eight and a half. She's two days older than me, still. Has a kid now, Gracie, who in seven years or so will be eight and a half and play dress up and seek out adult approval in the middle of some huge nationally televised sporting event. And ain't that grand. The horses break clean and ruffian, the filly is leading. My mom didn't bet on the ponies bet all year long, except on the Kentucky Derby. She had a system. I like that horse's name, she'd say. But mom, that horse is 30 to 1, I'd tell her. What can I tell you? I just like that horse's name, she'd say. And you couldn't argue with her because she'd been on a derby winning streak three years now. And because favorites hardly ever win the derby. Everybody knows that, mom said. So it's four years after Title IX is passed, and two years after Billie Jean King and the Astrodome greeting and beating Bobby Riggs, and Ruffian is leading in the backstretch until a jockey feels something wrong. When a horse breaks stride, when a horse breaks a leg, the jock knows it first, feels it in their thighs that are wrapped around a thousand plus pounds of animal. They call the amount of speed an automobile generates horsepower for a reason. It's not just, hey, let's call it you know, horsepower. Matthew Wilder sung years later, Ain't nobody gonna break on my stride, nobody gonna bring me down, oh no, I've got to keep on moving. Yeah. And I think he was writing from the perspective of Jorge Velasquez, Ruffian's junk, as he fought gamely to preserve her, as foolish pleasure surged so far into the lead. Like Secretariat, June 73, Triple Crown, Third Leg, Ron Turcott looking back over his shoulder to see where all the other horses were. Thirty plus lanes behind you, Ronnie, that's where. Sports Illustrator's William Knack said that when they performed Secretariat's autopsy, they discovered that the horse's heart was two and a half times normal size. It was as though Jeff Gordon's NASCAR crew chief, Robbie Loomis, had gone back into the garage before the race and under cover of dark, pulled out their engine and replaced it with one that pumped fuel two and a half times more efficiently. Only God had done it for the pleasure of man. Nack said that even in retirement, all the other horses on the farm would wait for Secretariat to eat before joining in. Sports Illustrated's Frank DeFord tells of praising Secretariat to his owner while the two of them stood aside the great chestnut colt in his Claiborne farm stall in Louisville, and Secretary at 10 years retired just snapped his eyes to attention in agreement staring straight into the reporter's eyes. That's right, DeFord, I'm Secretary of, and don't you fucking forget it, DeFord. <laughs> don't you fucking forget it. They say the feeling of a horse breaking down between your legs is something a jockey never forgets, like a car stopping on a dime unintentionally except the horse has feelings and is about to be killed, except that. They always try to save the horse after they make it earn them money, these people who raise horses, these great families with long traditions of breeding thoroughbreds, of buying yearlings at auction. They have this great love for the beauty of a colt in a field, but ultimately they strip the horse of all its freedom, put a saddle on its back, and make it run faster than it ever wants to, except when chasing a butterfly make it run faster than it ever wants to alongside four and usually more of its brethren, sometimes as many as 24 in a crowded derby, having to bring out the auxiliary starting gate for the horses numbered past 14 to leap from. And then jockeys in colored silks, and I mean pinks and yellows and mint greens, stay along for the ride, leaning down and forward, their asses never touching their saddles for the two minutes or so of the race, until they head into the locker room or wait with their saddle after the race, like they were weighed before, and hop into new silks in the training room, gearing up for the next race, or maybe first sweating off a few ounces in the box, wearing mylar sweatsuits to make weight. They 
say what hurt the aunt, Chris Antley, was that the weight he put on got him down, that he turned to speed to help him lose it, got busted, and had no more rides. But then he got himself back into shape, lost the weight, went clean, and had an old friend take a chance on him. 24 years after Ruffian broke down and everything was done to save her, before they put her down and buried her whole in the Belmont Park infield. And 24 years after that, the ant had won the first two legs of the Triple Crown. The ant had gone from exile, from drug addict and overweight, to one race from becoming the first jock in two decades to ride along for a Triple Crown, to one race from becoming the first jock since 16-year-old little Stevie Compton was up on a firm as they battled Alidor to one two finishes in the Derby, Freakness, and the Belmont. But in the backstretch, the ant felt something wrong, felt charismatic, this claimer anyone could have bought for $62,500 11 weeks before the derby, who'd beaten million dollar bonus ponies bought by Arab sheiks at auction, felt charismatic break stride. When the ant died or was killed 18 months ago, the picture on every screen as they told the story of the jockey who'd been up and down and up and then down for good, as they told the story of the jockey who'd found God only to lose his belief in himself. As they told the story of the jockey who'd slipped again and was doing dope again and left behind a pregnant wife and who'd been bashed with a ten-pound dumbbell that caved in the right side of his skull while in a drug den. As they told all of these stories, the pictures of the ant that they kept putting up on the screen of every TV in America was of the greatest 20 seconds the ant ever had. Better than any of those triple crown race victories, Better than the first time he put his foot in his father's laced together fingers for a boost onto his first horse's back. Better than all that. When the ant died or was killed 18 months ago, they made that footage of Prudhoe like for an instant, asked in everyone who'd ever loved to hear ABC track announce with Dave Johnson yell out at a triple crown race near at a triple crown race near its conclusion. And down the stretch they come. Tested in all their heads. The ant pulled the reins quickly on Charismatic, the colt biting the bit hard. The ant jumped off the exclaimer and went down to the ground and lifted its broken left leg up, not allowing the colt to continue to put any of its 1,200 pounds upon the broken limb, not allowing the chestnut wonder to shatter itself to death. The veterinarian rushed onto the track, ambulances screaming red, and began administering to Charismatic. And they said that the ant saved him. I, um, most of the poems I write are, um, at least for the last few years, I've been writing uh, a lot more postcard poems, a lot more daily poems. Um, I always, I almost always try and write with some sort of, you know, constraints, otherwise the words don't flow as often as I'd like them to. So, uh, so for about the last, uh, I guess since August 1st of 2004, I'm writing a poem, uh, a poem at night before I go to bed about that day. Anyway, um, so what I thought is, you know, something ended recently that really, you know, affected a lot of people and affected me. And I thought I would go through those poems and see if I touched upon it and you know, put them together and read a cycle that way instead of reading a month's worth. So, um, so this is the Gilmore Girls Project. June 7, 05. I'm starting to leave work early so I can catch Gilmore Girls reruns on the ABC Family Channel each afternoon at 5. I just thought you'd like to know that. That's all. June 9th. I've been using the same printer for my paper for three years, and for almost all of the time I've been sending them my computer files the same way. So at 4.30 in the morning I do it again. And then call up to let the computer late shift guy know that they're there, and within 10 minutes I normally get told they're okay and I go to bed. This time it's an hour with this computer room guy, and I realize it isn't going to work. I ask the production floor ahead what time the guy is being relieved, and he tells me 9, 9.30. So I make some decaffeinated Lipton diet iced tea, listen to some Mike and Mike on ESPN radio, and go to bed at 6.30 to wake up at about 10, and hope the new computer guy can help, and he can't. And he asked me to try many different things, and now it's 4.30 p.m., a half a day later. And I say, this time a bit louder than a few hours earlier, I'm sending these files to you the same way that I have for three years. It's not on my end, it has to be on yours. 
Two minutes later, he tells me everything is all right, and I go out to know the Gilmore girls are here. June 26, there was a Gilmore Girls Marathon on ABC Family today, <laughs> focusing on all of daughter Rory's men, the one in reruns. So at 1.45 p.m., I made 384 ounces of decaffeinated Lipton Diet ST, <laughs> and at 2, I was back on my bed with 32 of them. June 29th, 05, kept working all night on the next two Boog events, laptop on my bed as I watched TV, first to Gilmore Girls, and then sports talk shows on ESPN, and then Smallville which makes me want to watch Superman, the 1978 version with Christopher Reeves. And while I'm watching it, I wonder when Lex Luthor went bad. So I email Ryan, and he'll tell me it worked today. He'll tell me it worked. July 12th, 05. I'm leaving work early each day at 4.30, enough time to walk home, maybe buy some soda and pretzels, enough time to be home for five, and watch a Gilmore Girls rerun on the ABC Family Channel, catching up on what I've never seen. Just started watching this past season, so that's four hours of pay every two, every two weeks that this hourly wage worker gives up. But I can't tell you how happy it makes me. I really can't. <laughs> August 16th, 05. I'm liking Summer Tuesdays more than most other summer weekdays. The Gilmore Girls at 5 on ABC Family, then back to back at 8 on the WB. Three hours of Gilmore Girls. Three hours of Gilmore Girls. <laughs> I'm liking summer Tuesdays more than most other summer weekdays. September 27th, 05. After a night of not sleeping enough, of sleeping sporadically, I wake up just before noon. I watch some TV, and after a few days of slacking, I apply for a copy editing job. Then I watch the afternoon Gilmore Girls rerun, took an hour's nap, and headed off to Alan's CD release party. I wanted to stay in, but it was a few blocks away, and Alan's played some of my shows. It was 12 bucks, and I couldn't afford it, so I called, mentioned Boog City, and got put on the list. It was a fun show, packed with his friends. I chatted before it with Matt Islin, who played piano, and has performed at a few Boog shows. And then on the way home, I bought some junk food, including sour cream, to make some onion dip. I haven't bought sour cream in a long time. I had a Hawaiian punch, and so I bought them both. I made some dip to go along with the chips and pretzels, and I went on my videotape, and I leaned back on my bed against the pillows against the wall, and played that night's new Gilmore Girls. 10.20.05. Therapy for the first time in two weeks. Not much to say, well, a little more than normal. And out the door, after cutting myself on my windbreaker zipper and getting a band-aid from my therapist, on the walk to the corner, I think about whether to stop at the Christie's and buy some groceries. But instead, buy a two-liter caffeine-free diet Pepsi at a bodega so I can get home for the 5 o'clock Gilmore Girls, even though it's being taped. 10.25.05. Took a shower like my therapist asked. <laughs> it, it came four hours after I waked. By then it was 4.30 and I hadn't eaten, so I toasted three slices of seven grain bread, cottage cheese on two, natural peanut butter on the other, half a dozen strawberries and a half gallon of decaf sugar-free nest tea iced tea in place on my bed at 10 minutes to 5, 10 minutes to Gilmore Girls. 11.28.05, alone in my parents' house, negotiating the two floors, the distance between the den, there's TV downstairs, and the kitchen, and it's food upstairs. The kitchen TV locked to certain channels, my mom is taping, all sorts of daytime talk and her soaps, only her soaps she watches each night. But this taping on the kitchen TV means I can't watch Gilmore Girls at 10.30 because she's taping the Tony Danza show. So, so I hurry to prepare food to bring downstairs, a couple of pizza bagels and some Crystal Light lemonade, in time to receive Rory's first day at Chilton. December 20th, 05. It was a mellow birthday the way I wanted it to be. Some nice psychopharmacologist got a new lithium script with one renewal, too. Picked up some Sausalito cookies and a quart of skim milk, watched the Gilmore Girls and took a nap. Then Nathaniel came over and talked some more of Italian food, and he gave me a rare Cleveland book. It was a mellow day, just how I wanted it. December 24th, this evening on FX, I watched Daddy Daycare. Eddie Murphy has an ad man who loses his job, and he's looking to place his kid at the only decent preschool in town. A real strip place run by uh, me and Angelica Houston, and in the park a little later, his friend's wife casually says, and what this neighborhood needs is the decent daycare option to the real uptight school. So Eddie gets the idea to do just that, enlisting his ad man friend who'd been fired too, 
and it moves along predictably as Eddie Wars with Angelica used to, and then it hits the moment, the one in every movie, good or bad, where they wrap it all up and try to make you cry. And I cried at Daddy Daycare. <laughs> <laughs> I cried after crying yesterday at a Gilmore Girls episode, and, and then the U.S. version of Fever Pitch, and then the U. Grant movie about a boy. I cried at Daddy Daycare. Um, one uh, January 10th, uh, 06. Out of the apartment I go to run some errands before going back inside, pay my rent, pick up some meds, make a deposit to cover the rent check, then some light food shopping before back inside to bean and corn salsa, that's tortilla chips, two liter Hawaiian punch, and Gilmore Girls. January 18th, 06. Went to the fridge this morning looking for some breakfast food. Maybe toast with cottage cheese or natural peanut butter or plain fat free yogurt with grape nuts and raisins. And there on the second shelf beside a large aluminum mixing bowl filled with a repaired box of diet strawberry jello. And I so wanted to have this for breakfast. This large silver bowl filled with diet strawberry jello that I made last night when I wanted something sweet. A four hour wait until jello goodness. So I went to the fridge this morning looking for some breakfast food. Wind up having plain back free yogurt with grape nuts and raisins, and then ate the jello slowly during the Gilmore Girls that evening. January 19th, first time outside in a week. Food I want to eat is running low, so I leave for therapy extra early. Grab the press, the voice, the village, or the onion. Go to raise pizza and pick up a slice of Sicilian over a regular mushroom one. Get it to go, but just on a plate, not in a bag and get a cup of water too, so I take a bite at the counter and end up eating the whole slice there. Do some light shopping at the Gristiti, so when I leave therapy, I can head straight home and catch Gilmore Girls. January 23rd, 06. This is what happens when you're an unemployed, basically shut in. You watch TV all day while surfing the internet, reading that day's newspapers and news sports and gossip headlines. The half dozen or so blogs you check three times a day. And from the, time, from the time I wake, somewhere in the 10 to noon span until prime time begins at 8 o'clock, I know what I want to watch. TNT from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., which is back-to-back -back ERs and back-to-back -back Judging Amy's. Then ABC Family Channel at 2 for back-to-back -back One Meets Worlds. Then FX at 3 for back-to-back -back Spin Cities. And ABC Family from 4 to 6 for back-to-back -back Grounded for Life's and the Gilmore Girls episode. And from 1 to 6.20, flipping back and forth to them, the Mike and the Mad Dog radio simulcast on the Yes Network, ESPN News at 6 for sports talk shows, Around the Corner and Pardon the Interruption, and then sometimes Smallville at 7 on the ABC Family Channel. Of those repeats, I don't much like repeating. July 9th, 06. Ariel Cabell, I love you. In the fourth American Pie in the trilogy, as Dean's wife and the Gilmore Girls, they wrote you in as a short-term plot point. But the thing, Ariel, is that they were all wrong. Ariel Kebbell, I love you. In the fourth American Pine Trilogy. <laughs> August, uh, August 14th, 06. Knock off the press releases from my sister between two judging Amy's and one Gilmore Girls. The latter a 5 p.m. start to my afternoon target. October 3rd, 06. This may be the greatest night on TV, at least to me. Tuesday nights on what was the WB and UPN. At 8, there's the Gilmore Girls, and at 9 comes Veronica Mars. So at my parents, they're watching other programs, and I go to the den by myself for two hours for the second episode this season of the Gilmore Girls and the start of season three of Veronica Mars. And it doesn't disappoint this greatest night on TV to me. I'm beginning to dislike the Gilmore Girls. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something I never thought I'd say, but see, there have been plot points that I haven't liked, like, why would Rory ever take to heart the things that Logan's father said? <coughs> and then go and quit yell and not know just what to do, and, and, and why would she still be with Logan to begin with? And why give Luke a child, a 12-year-old daughter who was never told about, which would lead to Luke and Lorelai's breaking up and Lorelai's getting that night into Rory's dad's Christopher's bed, who she's dating now, going to Paris now with. And I want to stop watching the Gilmore Girls, but they say that this is the last season, about 18 episodes left. I guess that I can stick it out. I'm probably going to stick it out. <laughs> 
from November 14th, 06. It's still going on with the Gilmore Girls, this hatred I have for the Gilmore Girls. <laughs> how, how I used to look forward to it all the time, you know, wants to rerun the cycle again and again. But another plot point that's ridiculous, Lorelai goes to Paris and marries Chris. Why be so elaborate if when the show ends in May, it'll be Luke and Lorelai to stay? December 13th, 06. 24 years ago, first concert, Pat Benatar and Saga at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Root Canal talk to pretty young dental assistant. She dubs me music guy. I then mistake Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers pretty fallen for Don Henley's Boys of Summer. <laughs> she tells me she's seen Blink-182 and Bon Jovi a lot of times. Are you into music, she asks? Yes, I say. Have you heard of Paul Anka? I laugh. What, why are you laughing? Well, when a young woman says to me, are you into music, I don't really expect her to mention Paul Anka. <laughs> I just saw him last night and he was great. Yeah, I told her the dog on the Gilmore Girls is named Paul Anka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that show, she says. January 23rd, 07. <laughs> And wait, the Gilmore Girls and Veronica Mars are back tonight after time off for the holidays. It's the very best night on television, and this comes from someone who likes TV. Who really, <laughs> really, really likes TV. <laughs> March 6, 07. Gilmore Girls is progressing until its end, invariably. We all know what's to come, and though I know that Luke and Lorelai will be paired once again, I want to go there, and go there, and go there again. <laughs> March 27th, 07. My computer was running low, so I was going to shut it down before using it again. So I grabbed my current memo pad and I wrote down all the websites I had open so I could reopen them after I watched the Gilmore Girls rerun. Uh, NYDailyNews.com, still have to look at entertainment and sports. USAToday.com, see their coverage of Joe Theismann being tossed out of the Monday Night Football booth. ACAGalleries.com, to remind me to call Dorian about the series start date for the season. Google.com, image search for Olympic swimmer Amanda Beard. IMDB.com, checking if the miniseries from 1980, The Contender, is based on the book of the same name by New York Times columnist Robert Lipside that I read in junior high. SI.com, to read Peter King's Monday Morning Quarterback column, and then it's Tuesday edition. Folkartmuseum.com, to remember to tell mom about that Martin Ramirez show I saw mentioned on the Sunday morning show hosted by Charles Osgood. ValleyPoetry.com and CakeShop.com. August calendar so I can check on booking time for a poetry and music festival and some erotica site. <laughs> April 10th. I still can't get over the Gilmore Girls, how I enjoy the episodes again and again. But tonight, another rerun. Come back to me, please. <laughs> April 17th, 07. How do you find your way home when you're already there, Laura like Gilmore? Walking out of the Haybound Maze. May 1st, 07. And I will always love you. I will always love you. More like Gilmore. Sing to me in the bar by the river. Sing to me the way you do. Knee length, blue floral print dress. A slight hiccup to your voice. You're not a Buddy Holly, oh, well, well, well. Just your voice. Not quite right, but right. 